A set of questions have been crafted based on our student, question, our student feedback when we were developing this event. I'm going to ask the question, give everybody a chance to respond. This is our panel. So before I uh, ask any questions, you probably need to know who these individuals are. Jen Nick, right in the middle, can you go ahead and dispatch us uh, some introductions here? Of course. Hello. My name is Jen Nick. I work for Seattle Police Department. I've been there for six years. I'm a radio dispatcher, and all day long I say 911. What are you reporting? Good evening. I am uh, Lieutenant Jen Kolb. I'm with the Tumwater Police Department. I've been with Tumwater for 18 years come, come the end of June. And uh, I've held many positions within the agency and currently um, I'm a lieutenant and I'm in charge of our investigations division. Um, I'm also our public information officer and our background investigator. So. He's going down this way. Hi, I'm Maylee Barber. I'm a prosecutor, and I've uh, been practicing for 12 years. So I've been an attorney for 12 years, and in Bonnie Lake, it's a misdemeanor court, so we don't do felonies, so we'll do misdemeanors and gross misdemeanors. And I just recently started pro teming as a judge, too, which is very, very hard to do. Um, it is very hard. And so um, that's why I'm here. I've never been a defense attorney, though. Well, actually, I've done it once for my own ticket, so I'm like, <laughs> I'm one for one, so. Here, I'll use this one. Hi, good evening. Um, I'm Christine Yanez, I go by Chris. Uh, I work with the Bonnie Lake Police Department. I'm a community service officer. Uh, I've been with the department uh, just about nine and a half years now. Hi, I'm Chandra Brady. I've been in law enforcement, mostly corrections, for 25 years. I've worked for Cowlitz County, Lewis County, and now the City of Olympia Police Department. I'm currently the support administrator. I'm in charge of evidence, records, policy, budget, and our jail, and our new community-based crisis response team. Rebecca. Wait, 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 there's more. <laughs> Rebecca. <laughs> Hi, I'm Rebecca Fayette. I am a CSI detective with the Olympia Police Department. I've uh, been there 18 years, started out as a patrol officer, and am now a CSI detective. Hi, I'm Melissa Simonson. I work now as a prosecutor for a tribe, the Swinomish tribe, up near Anacortes, Washington. Um, I have been in the criminal justice field as um, a prosecutor or public defender for about 10 years. I started as a public defender in uh, Spokane County and uh, moved across, um, across the ocean to American Samoa and worked there for a while. I then came back and worked for the Colville Tribes as a prosecutor. I also uh, have been a special assistant United States attorney, uh, which means that I prosecute cases in federal court with our FBI agents and our uh, U.S. attorneys. Uh, I'm also a member of what's called the Safe Trails Task Force. It's a organization of tribes that collaborates with the U.S. Attorney's Office and the FBI agents to collaborate on drug offenses that occur throughout Indian Country, specifically drug offenses and uh, trafficking offenses, human trafficking and uh, sex trafficking. Hi, I'm Sheena Carr. I work for the Department of Corrections as a Community Corrections Officer, which is probation parole. I've been there for 11 years now. Um, and that's it. <laughs> All right, everybody, this is our panel. I'm going to ask, um, and you obviously have met Judge Whitener. Um, when I ask a question, whoever feels inclined to speak up first, go ahead and do so. I'm not going to force you to go on a line. And if you feel called to respond, go ahead and just uh, jump in, all right? So the first question is, what has inspired you, or what inspired you to go into the criminal justice field? Anyone want to start? Okay, I'll start. There you go. <laughs> so I um, did not grow up, oh, sorry, you can't hear me, I'll try to yell. I did not grow up uh, wanting to be a police officer. I actually wanted to be a teacher also, still do. Um, but I love my job. Uh, of the situations, sometimes you know what you want to do. I didn't. 
I was actually 28 years old when I decided I wanted to be a law enforcement officer. And uh, I was told I was too old at that time, and now I'm really a lot older. Uh, but a situation um, that was a bad situation where I actually ended up getting arrested, uh, it all got dismissed. Um, but because of that, there were good cops and bad cops. And so I really didn't think about it female, male, anything like that, I just decided that um, there needed to be more good cops in the world and that's why that inspired me to do what I do and I still love it today. Yeah. I think I followed a pretty similar path to Rebecca and the fact that uh, when I was going through school I wanted to be a teacher. And uh, my second year of college um, I decided I don't want to be a teacher. And I had met, uh, who is now Max's husband, who had been a law enforcement officer for several years. I think he's over 20 years now in law enforcement. And uh, I got introduced to the law enforcement world. And where I come from, women in law enforcement is extremely underrepresented. Um, still is. I'm not sure that there's more than two women law enforcement officers in that county today. Um, and, and so I got introduced to the career, and um, you know, I was a, spou I was a law enforcement spouse. And I realized, you know what, this is something I want to do. I had done some ride-alongs with him, and I'm like, man, this is great. I saw him helping people. I saw him out in the community making a difference. And because we came from a small town, everybody knew who he was. Everybody knew each other. And I'm like, you know what, he's making a difference. And he made a difference in a lot of kids' lives. Because back in the day, it was the D.A.R.E. program. He was a D.A.R.E. officer. Um, actually, the Washington State D.A.R.E. Officer of the Year. And so I saw the impact that he made, and I'm like, I want to make that same impact. I'd always been drawn to service. Um, that's why I was heading in the direction of being a teacher. And uh, I just happened to decide this is what I want to do. We got a divorce, and I went for it. You know, I had, a lot <laughs> I had a lot of people telling me, including him, you know, maybe it's not the career for you, um, trying to hold me back. And I'm the type of person, I persevere, and I push through it, and I'm like, I'm going to prove you wrong. And I also had a lot of um, law enforcement supporters out there from the you know, agencies that I had met. And I'll tell you, I may not have ended up a cop in that county, but uh, I am absolutely happy where I'm at in the career that I'm in. And 18 years later, I couldn't have asked for a better career or find myself doing anything else. Nothing against teachers, <laughs> but uh, law enforcement is definitely the direction that uh, I was meant to take. And I do get to spend a lot of time in the schools and working with students and still being, making that impact. Anyone else? Anyone else inspired? <laughs> Come on. Okay. All right. Now, was there anyone that particularly encouraged you? I know uh, Lieutenant Kolb, you just mentioned that uh, you had some law enforcement officers encourage you. And the next question is anyone that discouraged you? So, anyone have somebody that was like, yes, go, do this? I did. You know, I've had. Um I've had quite a few, and actually uh, some of them have been from the Aberdeen Police Department. Some of those, uh, it's funny because I had actually tested with the Aberdeen Police Department, and they didn't hire me. And here's what I've come to realize throughout the, my lifetime, but throughout my career, is that everything happens for a reason. And you may not absolutely understand today or tomorrow why that is happening to you, but eventually it will, you know, it will present itself. And I couldn't understand why I had all these supporters from the Aberdeen Police Department who were supporting me to become a cop, but they didn't hire me. And it was because I was meant to end up at Tumwater. And I still have all my friends at uh, Aberdeen that were supporting me and some friends at Hoakland that were supporting me. And uh, they absolutely pushed me. Every time I wanted to give up and I wanted to you know, stop the testing process, T testing process back then was a little bit different than it is now. And uh, every time I wanted to give up, they kept saying, go, keep going, keep going. It, it just takes a little while. Don't give up on your first test. Don't give up on your second test. Just keep going. And it took me a year, year and a half to get hired. Thank you. But uh, the fact that I had those supporters is pretty much why I'm here today. Excellent. Hey, Maylee, how about you? Anyone encourage or discourage you? I... <laughs> I guess there's not really a good answer. There, I did have a lot of encouragement, um, um, but also it is hard, especially uh, even though you do see a lot of female attorneys, there's still a lot of the good old boy club out there, and so it's really rough to um, be a female, maybe look younger than you really are too, and so they don't really understand that 
um, you know your way around a courtroom. And so even though I made it technically as a lawyer, um, even, um, and Carol can tell you, even on a daily basis, you still have to be able to um, fight many struggles, I guess. So just encouragement along the way would be people you work with, people to talk to, um, people to vent with, and maybe tell you that it's gonna be okay and just keep on going. But that, that's the hard part is even though you get up this big hill, you still kind of have to keep on struggling. But, um, but I did want to say, because I don't look like you that much, Jamie, so. I you don't. Is, is the majority of people up here are going to look a lot like me. Yeah. Well, so yeah. I wanted to tell everyone, um, I am half Taiwanese and half Mexican. So, um, you know, that comes with diversity in itself. And um, I did want to tell a quick story. Uh, in law school, I joined the Asian Law Students Association pretty easy. You can imagine why. I joined the law, Latino Law Students Association um, walked in and they kind of looked at me and I was like, you probably can't tell, but I'm Latina. And then one lady looked at me and she goes, I can tell by your butt. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, this lady's horrible. <laughs> and I thought some bad names in my head and um, she became my best friend and she is a bankruptcy, oh no, she's an immigration attorney and she's like the most wonderful person ever. And we got through, <laughs> we got through law school together, we studied for the bar together and um, I just think she is the coolest person. So even though, you know, like you know, Judge Whitener said, diversity you can't see all of it. It could be a lot of things. And so um, that brought us together. That that insult slash compliment. Um. <laughs> so I, I guess that'd be my next question. Is that um, it seemed like, you know, you just mentioned the the good old boys club. Anybody else feel like they've they've been part of that? Or had to struggle through that? Maybe I could just follow up. As yeah. another person in the, the legal field, when I started volunteering at the public defender's office, um, Natalie Durflinger was the one that brought me over to the Skagit, or excuse me, Spokane um, public defender's office. Um, I remember our juvenile uh, attorney said, okay, afternoon off, I've got to go meet the prosecutors off at the golf course because that's where we do our business at. And I thought, well, that's not going to work for me. I don't play golf. <laughs> like. And so one of the things that was f just took navigating was almost like you have to kind of be a few things. One, navigating more than one world, and sometimes I think of it as being almost bilingual in that. You have to keep true to yourself and who you are and who your character is and how you operate well, but also being able to operate in another world, knowing that it is what it is, and make it work for you. So. And I think for a lot of us women attorneys, you have to walk into the police department and kind of put a different, you know, <laughs> I, I hope that, you, that, we're, that I'm not talking out of turn here, but um, myself as compared to a male prosecutor, I have to put on a different voice sometimes and I have to do that in different um, contexts and different ways. And I feel like it's almost like speaking two languages and be able to go in and out of that um, a lot. But one thing I think for sure is staying true to yourself. Um, I think you do well if you find your strengths and keep capitalizing on those strengths. And when you volunteer and get a lot of this different experience, you'll start to blossom with what you're strong in. So the, the, what your strengths are will keep growing and growing and growing. So recognize what you're doing well and keep doing that and you'll keep growing in a good way. So one of the things, you, oh, go ahead, Jen. Okay. This is kind of just on my heart, so I got to say it. Um, I just want to give a shout out to everybody who's here just for the extra credit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I wanted to say I was you about six years ago. I was sitting here for extra credit and I remember there was a speaker who came in and he was a he was a police officer from New York or something. He's just telling crazy stories and I'm back there laughing. And he looked out and he said, don't be a police officer. Don't. We need people in the legal system. We need to change laws. We need to change the correction system. And there are so many people in this room that I hope Judge Whitener's story changed your life because in some way it changed mine. And if there's one thing that anybody says to you, it's just get your foot in the door.
So many people I talked to tonight said, oh, well, this is where I want to do, I want to do, you know, one gal, super awesome, I want to be on the SWAT team. Another person said, I want to, you know, be a diver, I want to do this. Get your foot in the door, whether it's as a dispatcher, like what I'm doing right now, or wherever you find an opening, get started. Do something, stop mapping out your life, and just get going. Open up the door and walk out and take little steps and you will be so shocked at what happens. Anyway, I just had to say that, that's what I did. Yeah, I like to speak to the concept of the good old boys club that was brought up and um, kind of give some credit to the gal who mentioned, um, it's like speaking another language. And one of the things that I think is great for those of you that are looking at entering the field now, um, now I have the privilege of being in command and I get to be who I am and be successful because I'm a woman, not in spite of the fact that I'm a woman. Um, but when we started this field 25, 26 years ago, it was a lot like learning to speak another language. And so a lot of the women that you see up here at this panel um, have been successful for so long because they were able to speak that language and they were chameleons. Um, and I can remember sitting at meetings and we always had to talk about football for 15 minutes at the beginning of the meeting. And I just remember thinking, this is the dumbest thing I've ever done in my life. But, you know, I took a sergeant's test and talked about football for 15 minutes at the beginning of the test and then I got to be a sergeant. I mean, it was kind of like you had to be more of a chameleon. And one of the things I can say that I'm proud of in the criminal justice field, and, and we still have room to grow, but I'm proud of the fact that now we are two embracing differences and we are seeing the value that it brings to having diversity of so many different styles and looks and invisible diversity as well that um, I, I'm proud of that. And I'm excited for those of you that are looking at joining the field now because it's a different world. Excellent, thank you Chandra. One of the questions I actually had was, was along those lines is that kind of what Melissa said and what Chandra said is that aha moment. Um, Oh, right, I am a female in this department. Anyone ever have that moment? I mean, Chandra, you explained yours, Melissa, yours was the golfing. Um, anybody else? I'll speak. Chris? I, I've had actually a couple, so I think the first one I've, uh, I had, I kind of speaking to her about getting your foot, getting your foot in the door. I started way back probably for a lot of you guys weren't even born yet. I, was, I worked at Sacramento County Sheriff's Department uh, about 25 plus years ago or so. And I was the same thing, I just wanted to get my foot in the door. So I became a records clerk, got familiar with that process, tested and promoted and became a records officer, kind of worked my way through. But my aha moment uh, kind of twofold is uh, when I moved up here I became a King County Corrections Officer. I did that job for about seven years and I was mentored by a female sergeant who she put me up on the psych unit and wanted me to work with the uh, acute and subacute psych uh, inmates that we had at the jail at the time and she inserted me into um, the unit there that was two male officers, way old school. And, I'm, and by reputation, they had the most crotchety dispositions ever, you know? And here, here is this blonde, they called me the blonde Barbie doll that comes in, you know, and you don't know how to handle your inmates and whatnot. Um, and I remember we had an incident happen in one of the tanks where there was an attempted suicide. It was stopped. And I was up there talking with one of them, with one of the inmates, and he was bad-mouthing the other officers that were down on the deck. So I, I corrected them, you know, and said, you know, I'm not going to listen to you talk crap about these guys. These are the people I work with. Well, unbeknownst to me, they had me on speaker, and the officers heard that. And it was kind of an aha moment for me because I stood up for them, because I felt it was the right thing for them to do, but I also gained that wisdom that I could do this job and have the respect without having to go above and beyond, because I'm thinking, how am I going to get past these guys where they're going to like me? And it was just being me and doing, you know, you don't badmouth other officers whether you like them or not. You're all one unit when you're, when you're there working. And that was, for me, was like, 
I can be me in this field. And probably the second, the second one that I had was when I uh, started to come back to this position where I got hired by Bonnie Lake. I had been off of work. I had left corrections, uh, had my son, and I took almost 10 years off. Uh, so I'm not going to tell you how old I am, but <laughs> needless to say, I was, I've always been in law enforcement. I'm thinking, where am I going to go where I can start back after being gone for 10 years when law enforcement's the only thing I've ever done? This opportunity came up with it at Bonnie Lake, and I'm thinking, I'm 42 years old. I have two kids, and I haven't worked in 10 years. So, and now I have to go through the Reserve Academy, and I have to go through five months of work and going at nights and all my weekends for five months so I can keep this job. And one weekend we were doing mock scenes out um, at the Academy, and the commander came up to me and said, you were the best one that ran the scenario. And it was so, felt, it was such a boost to my ego because it was, I've, I've always been like where I had to compare myself where I felt like I have to show myself even more because I'm an older woman with two kids and you know, I'm thinking I'd, I, I never had the confidence that I could do this job. And I got that affirmation of, yeah, I can do this job. And so I think that was my aha moment for me where it's like, yeah, I can do this and I can do it well and I can run with the boys and I can get their respect just by doing, being me. Right, thank you. <laughs> Sheena, how about you? You do something a little bit different than, uh, she has a deer in the headlights look, she gives me a lot. Uh, <laughs> you do something different than the rest of us do out here. There, there's been so many aha moments just throughout my career. Um, it, the, the little things sometimes are just what make you realize, I can do this. Um, running into the house with the guys, but being the first one to catch the bad guy and putting the cuffs on him, you know, it's like, aha, I can do this. Um, There, um, or even when I went to get my firearm, there were quite a few people that said, oh my God, she's really going to have a gun? That's, <laughs> that's scary. And proving to them that I, you know, I could shoot just like the rest of them. And um, I deserve to have the gun. I deserve to be out there in the field and be safe and have that. Um, it's, I guess the aha moments for me are more the self-confidence and showing myself more than anybody that I can do this just as well as the person next to me. Great, thanks. Is there anyone else that had that aha? Oh, right, I'm a woman. I'm a female in this. Chandra? Uh, I started in this field when I was 18 years old. I got to take an unarmed position at the Cowitz County Jail. Um, so that's uh, quite a privilege for me. Um, but I remember when I took the job, I, I, you get this feeling when they call for assistance in the sally port or, you know, you need to respond to a fight, you know, it's like, yeah! And I would run, run, and I'd get there, and one of the guys would... And I was like, oh, this isn't really working for me. Like, I want to get... I got gloves on. I want to put my hands on. And so I remember one day I was running, we had a place called Lower Housing, and it's where we had our maximum security prisoners. And so the officer down there called for assistance, and I was running down the hall, and there were only two of us, and I was like, yeah. And the sergeant next to me, Sergeant Giese, shout out to you, looks at me and says, go relieve Chris in the control room. And I looked back at him, and I was so tired of this, and I said, because I'm a girl? And he said, Never mind. <laughs> and I got to go to lower housing, and I got to use force for the first time, and then I got to stay two hours late and write my first use of force report. <laughs> because I'm a girl. Yeah. For, for every five minutes of action, there is five hours of paperwork. Um, so one of the things that we had talked about, we talk a lot about in our classes, are implicit, explicit bias. We're trying to educate for the future. And uh, Jen and I had this, Jen, Nick, and I had this conversation earlier today um, about that. And so, have you ever experienced 
clearly, Chandra, you, you, you have. That's that explicit bias uh, around being a female. Has anyone else ever had that kind of moment or dealt with explicit or implicit bias? Jen, you want to, you're chomping at the well, bit mine there. mine is just simple. Well, I work on the phone. It's just my voice. And so people will call sometimes and they'll say, you know, I'm, I, I know a couple off the bat. Um, somebody said, you're not black. I want to talk to somebody who's black so they understand how I feel. And I said, you know what? I, I'm so sorry. I'm not going to understand how you feel. But I can guarantee you that I love you and I'm going to take whatever you say seriously and I'm going to send you the help you need. And he said, thank you. And he went on and he told me and I helped him. And I said, at the end of it, I said, at the end of the call, I said, thank you. I said, I learned something by that tonight. And I'm sorry for whatever you've been through that you feel that way. But I'm going to take something away from it. And he really respected that. And sometimes we do get that. I mean, I can only imagine how you guys get it on a major, more extreme level and in your face. I can hang up the phone. But um, <laughs> that, that was mine. I'm... Um, you would think as a judicial officer that I don't face implicit and explicit bias, but I'll tell you of two recent incidences that uh, I experienced. Last August, I did a program at the court to address what we call the gavel gap in that um, there aren't enough women um, on the bench or in the legal profession or disproportionately not enough women of color. So I did a program at the court building called Color of Justice. And we had um, girls ages 10 to 19 come into the court building. I had judges, female judges, um, different backgrounds come in to empower and inspire these young girls to the judiciary or the legal profession. I fashioned the program to address marginalized girls because if you remember around that time, women were being attacked um, from the highest down. So the program was to address girls, you know, feeling um, not empowered. Well, after doing that program, and it was a success, um, got a lot of publicity, and I got on a hate website, and I was called the N-word. N-judge, you know what N stands for? N-judge trying to inspire and empower um, girls to the bench. So that was explicit, if there ever is explicit bias. Well, the day before the program occurred, my wife and I were getting into the court building. I had used my Linnell to get in, put in my code, and we were stopped. And we were stopped by a white correction, white security um, guard. And he said, pretty much, you can't be here. And now remember, I used my Linnell to get in. It's a little after hours, and he was just breaking down. And at first I thought he meant, well, maybe, you know, um, he thought maybe we slipped in with somebody else's Linnell card. But no, there was nobody else around. So he says, um, he stops us, and he says, you have to go through the security um, machine. So my wife, military, follow orders, and she's ready to take off her belt. And I was like, no, you, you, no, we're not doing that. <laughs> so I told him, get your supervisor. So he's all upset. No, we're not doing any of this. Get your supervisor. So he gets the supervisor, and as the supervisor comes down, he sees me, and he says, Judge Widener? And I said, yes. And I just happened to look, and I caught this guy's face, and it was red. <laughs> and I won't use the word that I would call it, but, you know, it was red. Now, what's interesting about this, on the back wall where I'm standing is a picture of the judges on the wall. <laughs> And remember, I'm the only black female on any courts in the system in Pierce County. There's my picture with my colleagues on the wall behind me. Right around the corner is my courtroom with my name, okay? 
And this guy stops us because we didn't look like we belong. So when he was told that I'm Judge Widener, you know what the apology I got was? Well, you should have just told me you were a judge. And I looked at him and I said, it should not have mattered because we belong. So there's my, you can call it implicit bias. I call that explicit on both ends, yeah. but it happens even to me. Anybody else have that, that moment? No? Okay. So are each of you where you want to be in your career? I am absolutely where I want to be in my career. Um, I started off in patrol. Um, I spent a couple years in patrol, and uh, I got uh, selected as being one of our, one of our relief supervisors, um, which, being so young, I think I was, I started when I was 23, and I think I was 25 when, uh, when I got selected to be a relief supervisor. That was one of my aha moments, that I had only been there two years, been a cop for two years, and already they're putting me in charge of people. <laughs> and uh, let alone, you know, people who had, you know, lots and lots of years over me. So that, that was an aha moment for me. But um, so I decided that, uh, you know, th there's something more to this. There's, I'm not the type, I don't, you know, like driving fast and shooting my guns and, you know, fighting with people. I don't mind it, but that's not <laughs> what gets my adrenaline going. It's solving cases, putting together a puzzle, um, helping people solve their problems. You know, people that can't solve their own problems, my job is to come out there and, and help them do that. And the more complex the puzzle, the more uh, satisfaction I get out of doing my career. So what's the next logical step for me is investigations. So, so I spent 10 years in our investigations division. And uh, through that 10 years, I had uh, a lieutenant who I absolutely look up to. He's my commander now. And, you know, he just made the job of being a lieutenant detective look so damn easy. And I'm like, this is what I, this, this is the cream of the crop right here. <laughs> I want to run the investigations division. And so that was, you know, I'm like, by the time my career is over, that's what I want to do. And it just so happens that uh, we kind of had a restructure in our department and um, we had sergeant's positions come open. I promoted. Um, to sergeants, which took me out of investigations. Broke my heart, but I knew this is ultimately where I wanted to be. And so, you know, it took me two years. Um, I quickly jumped from sergeant to lieutenant, and uh, the goal the entire time was to be the um, detective in charge of, or the lieutenant in charge of detectives, and that's where I started at the beginning of May. So this is, this is where I've always wanted to end my career. Now I have like 17 more years to go. <laughs> And so now I've got to figure out what I'm going to do next. But, uh, you know, it's, if, if I can spend the next 17 years in this position, I'll be absolutely happy. Um, there's other things that I can do while I'm in this position, and that's one of the reasons why I like it so much, is getting out in the community and building the bridges and making those relationships, being able to participate in forums like this. So, um, I mean, really, what better is there? I get to help people solve problems, and I get to meet new people and be a part of the community. So... And I'm not just responding to calls and, you know, stop an action. It's, there's more to it, and this is the best ever. Yeah. Chandra, you seem like you got something. I would say my answer is the exact opposite. <laughs> um, I absolutely am not where I want to be in my career. I always say I haven't yet decided what I want to do when I grow up. Um, I've had a really blessed career. I got to be a sergeant when I was 24. I got to be the youngest female deputy chief in the state of Washington when I was 29. Um, I get to work for a great police department and uh, work with some amazing people in the city of Olympia, but I'm going to school to get my PhD, and I, I don't know why, really. I think it'd be cool to be Dr. Brady. Um, <laughs> but I, don't, I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up, so I'm excited to find out what that is, but this is definitely isn't it for me. I'm not sure what it is, but... I like that. Chris, how about you? Um, I think for me, um, right now, I kind of uh, wear many hats in the job that I do, and uh, I'm in charge of property and evidence. We have a pretty small agency. We have, um, so I uh, do a lot of jail transports, and I do a lot of community events, and then I've also got a full-time job doing property and evidence. But what's been uh, 
my ideal thing to pursue with the department is we, uh, where I can start coming out to crime scenes and actually processing the crime scenes. And I've been uh, taking those classes and I've had a chief that's afforded me the opportunities to learn that where uh, I hope to be um, the first evidence officer that gets to start going out to crime scenes. So um, that prospect is, you know, po uh, completely possible for me and I'd like to see that. I'm kind of in the twilight part of my career, yeah, but I still got a few years and I'm not quite there yet, not to pasture, but grazing kind of. <laughs> so um, I'd, I'd like to try to do that and I would like our, our, our CSO program is kind of a hybrid from patrol. We don't, we train with patrol. We do all, we have to do everything that a patrol officer does except we don't respond to calls unless it's a hot scene like an active shooter or something of a oh crap scenario. But we do a lot of um, the jail transports and court security and that program, we have really grown in the time that I've been here where we've had uh, another officer added on, possibly another one's coming on board. And it would be nice to be able to come in some type of supervisory capacity and to continue to grow that. So those are some of the goals I'd like to see happen. Okay, Maylee, how about you? I think maybe someday I'd like to uh, run for city council or be a mayor. I always joke with people, wait till I'm mayor, you know. Because <laughs> working for so many cities, I think I would have a little bit of a, a background of where I think money should go. Um, I'm obviously biased towards the prosecution and law enforcement, but, <laughs> but I think that's something that I would like to do eventually. Um, but I would definitely miss the people I work with. Carol and I worked with Chris for so many years that we could actually have conversations across the room without moving our lips. Like, you just you 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 work with these people that you just love, but um, but maybe I think that would be my future eventually, and maybe fix some of these weird laws that they don't make sense. So, from our opinion, or my opinion, <laughs> right, Rebecca. Um, so when I started uh, with. Olympia. I started out on patrol, did that for seven, actually almost eight years, worked a lot of graveyard. Uh, I became a detective uh, in 2008 and worked really hard at doing that and uh, our detectives are a four-year rotation. You, once you get four years in, you then rotate back to patrol to give other people opportunities. So uh, I had worked very hard um, with a lot of other departments and my lieutenant, and we created a crime scene investigator position. That position is a, um, it's half crime scene and it's half digital forensics. So I'm not only a digital forensic examiner where, like right now I have a 300 plus item backlog because it's just me and my department um, that does that position. And so, the digital forensics part, I did a lot of training since 2009, pretty much put my heart and soul into it, spent a lot of time away from my family. I'm married and had young kids at the time, um, still one that's young. Uh, but then the crime scene position, I also did a lot of training. I spent 10 weeks at the University of Tennessee, spent a lot of my blood, sweat, and tears and away from my child at the time that was three. And so I did all this training to, um, get these certification and these titles and I'm absolutely where I love in my job. I finally think I don't know everything, but I'm learning and my position is rotating out at the end of this year. So I get to have somebody else come in that gets to take over the training, but for me, I am totally where I've always wanted to be. I love investigations. I love I love always learning and continuing to learn, and um, which I still have done all through the process. And so now um, I get to go back rotating to patrol, which means I go back in a vehicle. Um, we're one man, one woman <laughs> <laughs> operations. And you would think I'd be like, oh, I am very bummed because I love my job, but I'm also very excited about the person that is going to be taking over and what he's going to create with the position and I get to go back and learn again, learn again patrol, and I've got 18 years in, and so, um, you know, I still need a couple more years before I'm gonna retire, so, um, quite a few to get to 53, but um, not as many as I'd like, but <laughs> I'm almost there. Uh, but so for me, I do love where I'm at, but um, things change. 
positions change, people change, chiefs change, everything does, and so um, I'm just kind of, even though I love where I'm at, I'm looking forward to a little bit of a change. Mm -hmm. Melissa? Thanks, Mr. Sure. Um, so I don't know if, um, like doctors have a board, you have to be a doctor, you have to be the board. And <coughs> our judge talked about to be an attorney, you have to take a bar. There's a board that governs our practice of law. And uh, one of our justices, we have two Supreme Court justices, um, Justice Gonzalez and Justice Yu. Justice Gonzalez at our Board of Governors meeting, the board that decides whether you should be banished from the practice of law because you did something unethical or celebrated for your accomplishments. He took a picture and posted it on Facebook. Um, it was not reflective of who we have here in this room. And that is sad for me. And if I could say one thing that I'd like to see different in my career as my profession is that the attorneys in the state of Washington reflect who are here in this room. What I think is critical for our practice of law in Washington state is for us to reflect the people that we serve, and that's not what we have right now. So what, what we heard from Justice um, Whitener is... Justice. Judge. judge. I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> elevating her already. <laughs> so when she does run sometime for Washington State Supreme Court. Um, but you in community college, you can look down to your um, friends in high school and, or, you know, who aren't here yet and pull them here. And when you keep going, keep pulling people up with you. And when you decide, I think I'm gonna, I wanna go to law school, reach out to the people that might be able to help you because there, there's books that tell you how it's supposed to be done, but there's many ways to do it. Getting your library card, walking through the door and saying, I'm gonna check out this book, I'm gonna keep it under my pillow at night and read it for half an hour before I go to bed every day, and that's how you're gonna get to law school, that's okay. And, keep that legacy going, looking back and looking forward. I'm sure the people here on this panel, you can Google our names and find our contact information. Swinomish, if you're interested in starting this path and wanna have coffee and talk about how do, you, how do you get there, how do you open that door, reach out to any of us and we can help give you guidance. Thanks. Sheena, are you where you wanna be? And if not, where are you going? At this moment, I'm absolutely where I want to be. Um, if you look at it on paper, I've been doing the same job since I started with the department 11 years ago. But it's not the same job since I did an internship when I was in college uh, for the Department of Corrections, and I actually got to learn what a community corrections officer did. The officer that I was following, she worked in a police station with the police officers. She's still Department of Corrections, still saw her offenders like she was supposed to, but worked right there with the police. There are very few spots in the state that people actually get to do that, or CCOs actually get to do that. Um, it took me 10 years to finally get that spot, and I have it now where I'm, my office is actually in the Pierce County Sheriff's Office in the Peninsula Detachment. So I'm working every single day with police officers, and we get to share the information as to what's going on with everybody in the community. Um, I'm one of two females on the western side of the state who actually gets to carry a law enforcement radio at the moment. So it's amazing to me. Like That's where I've wanted to be for 15 years now, and I'm finally there. So. Thanks. Jen, are you where you want to be? When I first met you, this wasn't your plan. <laughs> I wonder what that plan was at the time. I always joke with people and say, I'm going to be the chief of police somewhere. I don't know where, but no, I, I always try to set my, uh, my goals and aspirations pretty high, and I'm pretty proud of where I'm at from where I came from. And um, I think that well, I'm right in the middle of promotion now, and I'm being recorded, so yeah, I'm real happy where I am. <laughs> um, but no, I, I always dreamed of being a police officer. I want to be hands-on with somebody. Like when somebody needs help, I want to pull them up. 
when somebody needs to get out, I want to pull them out. It's just what I dreamed of doing, and maybe a gun and a badge isn't it. Maybe it is. Um, I'm going, you know, looking at that option, but I'm just keeping the door open and listening and um, taking people's wisdom um, to heart and listening. So I don't know yet. We'll see. Yeah. Judge Whitener, are, are you where you want to be? No. <laughs> Because I was supposed to be a teacher. <laughs> so no. But I, I'll say this. My career has never been my, my own. It's always been um, some other being. Because you've heard my history. You know, I didn't think I'd be back in Pierce County. I didn't think. But it... it was happening. So for me, it's always being open to the opportunity when it arises. But in regards to um, where I am, where I would like to be right now, yes, because I think I'm making the most impact that's needed, especially in Pierce County, especially for this position, being the only black female immigrant born lesbian. You know, it's like really, we're in 2018. Um, there's a lot of voices that are not um, represented on this bench or any bench actually in uh, Pierce County. I think actually I'm the only black female judicial officer. So um, I have plenty work to do. That's why I get out into the community trying to be visible so that uh, folks can see the possibilities and I'm really serious about that. Um, so hopefully you would think about it, but am I where I'd like to be? Yes. Am I where um, I am going to be tomorrow? Haven't a clue. Might get a call tomorrow from somebody saying, you're going somewhere else and I'll just be ready to do that, so. Excellent. Since the theme was inspiration, obstacles, or challenges and triumphs, I haven't even asked what has been the biggest obstacle or challenge and with that, I'm going to kind of put that together. I want to know what your biggest obstacle or challenge was in this career path, whether it was within your department or personally, and then what was or what is the biggest triumph? What's the thing you're most proud of? All right, um, I guess we're going yeah, to Yeah, just go it. straight on down. Yeah, let's do it. Um, the biggest obstacle was getting people to see me and see my capabilities um, and um, I worked really hard to be visible, and um, by doing that, they were then able to see my capabilities um, and the possibilities that I could bring to the table so that my voice and my, my, uh, my being could be um, appreciated. Um, the, what's the other part? What's your biggest triumph? Oh, my biggest triumph is just being here, um, getting here. Um, considering, like I told you, you know, I started off um, at 16 in a foreign land, um, maneuvering through a different system. Um, you know, the British system is different from the American system. Um, all of my family was in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, so I had to make friends. I had to create extended family. I had to create mentors when they didn't want to be a mentor. I created a mentorship. Um, and now I give back by mentoring. And um, so that's, I think, my biggest triumph is just actually being here. And um, my struggles have paid off. So yeah, failure was not an option. Thank you. Rebecca, how about you? Biggest obstacle or challenge and then the, either your biggest triumph or the thing you're most proud of? So my biggest obstacle, there were, I didn't really have huge ones. There were a lot when I started. Um, like I said, people said I was too old, and I'm thinking now, well, gosh, now I'm really old. Um, but I had little things along the way, um, and of course there were not on, we have two different teams in Olympia, and at that time I was the only female on what we call the gold team. And so for me, at first when I started, I kept thinking, oh, they're going to treat me different because I'm a girl. I got to do this because I'm a girl. I got to prove myself more. And I finally 
the obstacle I was almost creating for myself was I had to realize that I needed to be a good officer. I needed to be the best officer, the best police officer, the best person. Um, I had a young child, so trying to juggle graveyard and family, and so I had all of those obstacles, and then my own, um, and so I dealt with that all along the way, and then the biggest triumph I think um, for me is that um, I have always, I've been with Olympia since I started. I, I love the city, I love the department, and even after 18 years, which May 17th was my anniversary, I still get up and go to work in the morning and know that I'm gonna give more than 100%. I still am gonna do the same exact thing I did back in the beginning. Regardless of who I am, I'm gonna be the best detective, um, the best friend at that day, the best mom I can be, and so just regardless, I just am proud that I still want to do that every day. Excellent. Thanks. Melissa? Um, sure. I think something that is a challenge for me, I was telling my kids the other day, some, something, I had a big meeting at work and I had a little bit of butterflies and I said, oh man, this is like the butterflies I would get before trial. And they were saying, what, you get butterflies in your stomach? Yes. Um, so. I think um, a, a challenge is, is when, when we have our safe trails meeting, there's full of uh, FBI agents that are assigned in our um, kind of Whatcom and Bellingham area and um, Skagit County and Snohomish. Um, we meet and we talk about these big drug cases or these sex trafficking operations that we have coming up and s getting all of our charging documents ready, the search warrants all ready. Um, there's three women in the room. Um, the U.S. Attorney, Becca Cohen, um, Assistant U.S. Attorney, um, a de tribal member from Tulalip, she's a detective and has been for, I think, five years there, and then myself. Uh, so sometimes just coming into those meetings, I have butterflies thinking, okay, how, gear up now, you, this is, you know, big time, you gotta put your um, armor on, but the triumph of it is when I, you know, I have my goals that I need to accomplish. We have our goals, we're working together. I, you know, I've got my things that I've got to get ready um, when it all goes well. So we had a operation that we did now um, that we can talk about. It was a, at our casino, a sex trafficking operation that went really well. Um, really good charges came out of it um, with that collaboration. And a lot of it was my work on there. And I, you know, to come on, yeah, it was a challenge and it was super scary sometimes just to say, okay, this is what we need to do. Here's all the things that we have and let's bring it all together. And then at the end of the day, when you're applying for the search warrants and working with federal magistrates and it all works and that's awesome. That's the triumph at the end of the day. Thanks. Sheena? Um, I think we face obstacles every day. I don't think they ever stop or... Um, I mean, they, they started when I knew I wanted to go in the criminal justice system. Um, back in high school, I said, I'm, I'm going to be in law enforcement somehow. My entire family said, no, women are teachers. You need to be a teacher. Um, then it was to the point where my family wasn't going to help pay for college because I didn't want to be a teacher. And... Um, finally making it through college, making it into the job I'm in, in now. There's obstacles every day where men don't want to work with you or um, you're not in the in crowd, so people don't want you in their unit or going on their search team or whatnot. Um, you have to prove who you are every day. Every time somebody new comes in, you still have to prove who you are. Um, and I guess the, the triumph of that is just knowing I've done it, I've come here, um, and every day getting up and putting on the same uniform and being able to prove to everybody, but mostly to myself, I can do this, and I'm going, whatever obstacle comes at me today, we're going to make it through it. Thanks, Gina. I think the biggest challenge for myself is understanding and accepting that you will fail. And rising up, 
getting back up on the horse and going at it again and never giving up um, because it is bound to happen and little things are going to come up. Drama will arise. And, you know, even Judge Whitener, you were talking about it. No, I put my head down. Everybody in 1L, first year of law school, it's hard. It damages, it damages lives and relationships. But you put your head down and you get through it. And um, getting through those little things along the way. Um, the biggest triumph. Um, I think the biggest triumph is um, when somebody comes and gives you a pat on the back and says, thank you for bringing me up or picking me up. I needed it. It just, it's right. I like helping other people. It's so much more gratifying. I think the biggest uh, challenges that I faced um, throughout my career is come from myself. Um, I'm my own worst critic. Um, I came in with a perception of law enforcement and changing that perception. Um, I think I've already said it once, but I'll shout it to this guy. I'm really blessed to work for the city of Tumwater and the Tumwater Police Department and the men and women that I work with. And when I got hired with Tumwater, I was fortunate to come into a department where there's already three female law, enforcements, law enforcement officers, one of them a lieutenant. And so they already had kind of paved the way for me. Um, kind of broken through that ceiling. And so when I came in, I was the fourth female and I had the um, opportunity to follow in some great footsteps. So I wasn't necessarily paving the way for women in law enforcement in the Tomwater Police Department. So what I had to do is I had to get over my own implicit biases or um, my own challenges of this perception that I needed to fit in, that I needed to prove, you know, I think all of us, in law enforcement will say the same thing. We have to prove ourselves every single day. And, you know, we're trying to prove to the men in this, you know, law enforcement um, world that we can do the job as well. And we're kind of in a generation now where we've done that. We, you know, we're proving that to people. And I've been fortunate where I work for an agency where nobody's saying to me in my agency, you can't do this or you can't participate in that. I've had a lot of opportunities and it's not just because I'm a female or in spite of being a female. So for me, it's getting past that mindset of I have to prove myself. I've already proven myself. And they tell me every day, you don't need to keep proving yourself, but it's just that mindset that I have because this is the perception that I, I, I've had going through this career. Um, for me, triumph, I can't say that it's really a part of my career. My, my triumph is um, my family. You know, the, the success that my family um, has, not just as because I've been a police officer, but um, just as keeping it all together. You know, working shift work, um, getting through that as a family, the hard times, going to a crime scene and where you're, you're holding a deceased child and taking that home with you because that's what this, a lot of what this career is. I mean, we're dealing with the negative um, more than we're dealing with the positive, unfortunately. And so we take those, those issues, you know, th those home with us. And so it's coming out on top in the end and coming together as a family at the end of the day or the following morning when you get home from your shift um, I have a, she's almost 21 year old daughter and she's in her sophomore year of college going through for law and justice. So I feel like that's my biggest triumph is having made an impact on her and having um, a support system that I know I can rely on in those difficult times. And it's, it's everything to me. That, that's my biggest triumph is it didn't, the negative didn't get me down.